all right so good evening and uh welcome to the stream today as we look at our examination for tomorrow and that is going to be public sector accounting and finance uh for the most part we're going to have um what financial management in the afternoon to p.m but depending on the outcome of how many students we got in that regard or what questions i get in that regard i will also try to look at the financial management issues as well but for the most part i'm going to be maximizing this session on public sector accounting and finance in that case so welcome to the session today we are um live on what the heck facebook as well as on youtube so as well so if there are any questions you have for me something specific you want me to share my thought on you can put them in the comment section for me or the chat box for me on facebook as well as on youtube then those of you joining me live on the zoom call you can raise your hand i bring you up or you put it in the chat for me also if you cannot talk or there is a lot of noise in your background so let's go straight up into the discussion my focus tonight is going to be based on two things. Number one is to let you understand the structure of the syllabus. That is question one, what is going to be there? Question two, what is going to be there? Question three, what is going to be there? What are the key things that you have to focus on to optimize yourself to pass the public sector examination? So that's the first thing I want to look at the structure of the exam. That's my first goal tonight. My second goal is going to be the issue in respect of the structure of the questions that you are going to be getting in the exam hall. And like I say this always, the, the issue about public sector is that it's one of the papers that you can pass very easily. I mean, it's very easy to pass public sector, but if you screw it up a lot, you can also get a miserable score when your results are released, but it is a very simple paper to pass so two things i want to look at tonight the structure of the examination the structure of the syllabus and then also talking about the structure in respect of the examination itself and the way the questions are going to be looked at generally for the most part so again you are welcome to the stream if you are joining us on facebook as well as on youtube if there are any questions you have put them in the comment section or the chat for me i'm going to be reading all your questions and also providing you with some answers as we get excited into the discussion but before i get excited into the discussion if there are any specific questions something that you want to pick my brain on you can raise your hand i bring you up those of you with me on zoom or put it in the chat for me then those of you watching on youtube and facebook you can also put it in the comment section or the chat box for me so any specific things something you want me to share my thought on you can throw that at me quickly as we take them out before i get excited into my discussion for the day let's see if i have uh i can pull up my comments on facebook here because i have youtube here but facebook should be here okay so specific questions okay something specific sweet straight to the point it's not now that we're going to be wasting time on things so if something specific and then i can provide you with some answers facebook in the comment session youtube in the chat zoom you can raise your hand i bring you up or put it in the chat for me something specific you want me to ch share my thought on and let's see what we can do yes benjamin your hand is up uh, good evening please uh about the the trial single account the two models if you can explain the two models what, you, what did you say the trial single account trial single account treasury single account yes uh, and we have the what's... two models and you said what? the difference between the two the difference between the two models which models the treasury single account we have two main models of the treasury single account so i want to know there are difference i really don't know the context of your question because yes the treasury's main account is the 
uh central accounts of the government into which is the same as the consolidated fund of the government into which all government revenues are received out of which all government payments are made so if you are asking about the two models of it i don't know if i get the context of your question really i don't think i have a context of your question really in respect of what you're yeah. asking me in that particular okay, thank case. You. All right. Um, good evening. Along the line, as you are summarizing everything, kindly sum what's it? Kindly point out the key things to look out for. Kindly point out the th key things to look out for in cash flow statement or cash budget later for me oh goodness and mercy <coughs> uh, okay i hear i'll see what i can do about that question um any other questions for me uh let's see what do i have here uh, also then, um, God bless you for the work you are doing. Amen. Thanks for that. Uh, what else we got? Give me a sec. <laughs> uh, Jesus. Hey, here it is. Well, I'm about to. Okay, so give me a sec i want to just see if i can pull this out before we go i'm seeing some other comments coming up let's see if i can pick them up quickly um so we go i don't know why f um okay Emmanuel, of her, please, can you explain the three key objectives of measurement basis? I'm going to come into that uh, later on in my discussion, so you stay connected. If there are other issues, I can talk about quickly. Okay. I think I can probably go now. Um. Uh, okay, let's see. There's a last question, probably. Let's take this. Uh, Jedu Eben said, Ishra, please give us an overview of public procurement and the areas to look at. It is too voluminous. Um, you know, I am, I'm trying as much as possible to ensure that I am, you know, within the ambit of what I want to discuss tonight with you guys. Um, there is no shortcut to the examination. There is no areas I can give you about pub uh, public procurement. You think it is too voluminous? There is no shortcut. I wish I can tell you, oh, it's too voluminous. So just read this and go away. No. Everything under public procurement, the examiner can ask you about it. So there is no shortcut. There is no areas of focus. Everything under public procurement, the examiner can ask you for 10 marks. So I wish... I can tell you, oh, focus on this. Oh, just learn this, you'll be good. No. No. You got to learn everything. And it is not voluminous, in my opinion. It's a syllabus coverage. That is the content there. And you have to know about it. 
and if at this point you have not covered it in details i don't know though so there is no shortcut in that case so that is what i would say in respect of that thing i cannot tell you focus on this focus on this look at this or look at that in public procurement you read everything from cover to cover 10 marks will be there and you have to understand it period there's no shortcut that's what you need to understand <laughs> okay let's see if i get some few things please can you help me with a threshold for goods and services work for national competitive tendering <laughs> all right i'm gonna bring that up later on in my discussion when i'm talking about public procurement who is that that's felix right so i'm gonna bring that up during my discussion of public procurement so when we get there felix you'll be able to uh see the threshold issue again so we're gonna go through that so just stay with me here uh, what else do I have? Let's see if I have some other things that I can talk about. Um, hello, Inshira. Is there, will there be a session for financial management? Yes, this session is supposed to be a combined session, uh, financial management and public sector accounting and finance. So if you have questions for me for financial management, you can hit me with it and I can tell you about it. Uh, briefly explain high and low method under IFRS 9, under F9. High and low method under F9. What is F9? Financial management. What kind of high and low method under F9? Financial management. Alan, what do you mean by high and low method? Charlie, you guys should give me s specific issues that I can talk about. Oh, I mean, at this time, you got to hit me with specific things and the boring questions that you people are asking me. The, oh, nah. Oh, Nah, can you throw more light on the margin of preference in public procurement? <laughs> All right, I hear Gideon. <laughs> I'll talk about that when we get to public procurement, okay? So don't worry. You know why I'm laughing? Because, you know, <laughs> oh, goodness and mercy, Shira. God have mercy on Ishira Premium tonight because I mean I'm just trying as much as possible. <laughs> oh Jesus Christ. Uh may your name be praised forever and ever. <laughs> oh goodness. <laughs> Sorry, okay. Gideo, I'm not laughing at your question, okay? Just that I mean it's it's interesting the kind of questions i'm getting tonight and i'm getting i'm seeing the pop-up of a couple of chats here and the kind of questions coming up and <laughs> oh charlie all right so let's go i'm gonna try as much as possible to see what we can do insurer place one um also then insurer place one i sent to you on whatsapp what the heck did you send on whatsapp all right, let's go. Inshira, the thing is, we are using you for our last revision. You know? That is why we need summary of everything. You are using me for your last revision. Wenya. 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 Okay, so let's see. I think a few more, then we go. Uh, Mawu. What is that? Mawulox. Is that an airway name or okay just forgive me Ishra, please can you explain the weakest link method in the in pifa i'll get to pifa so don't worry i'm gonna take that as well so stay with me maul maul lax uh something like that joan sofori dexin what the heck are you doing on youtube joans why are you not joining the um or it's not the joannes i know about why are you not on the zoom call Please, why don't you teach us what you plan for us <laughs> before taking the question? You know, right? Because the questions coming in is just uh, interesting. Israel, please, I think that you should start with what you <laughs> want to do. 
that's true right so you because i thought that i'm going to be hit with a couple of you know questions that will cost me to talk about before i get excited but sir please the pillars can we mix it when we are outlining yes yeah, certainly you are not seeing any uh, it's not about oh like you should arrange it in that order that kind of thing you can mix it up when you are writing does that make sense so there's no problem on that okay so let's go let me bring up my slide and let's get excited quickly um let's see what slide do i have let's go all right two things like i said i want to do tonight number one is to tell you about the structure of the syllabus and the question one what is going to be there question two what is going to be there three what is going to be there four what is going to be there and all that and then number two is also to tell you about the context of the question and how you're going to approach it in the exam hall so i'm going to try as much as possible to give you context of the question the structure of some of the questions that you are likely to have in the exam hall and how you're going to be approaching them when the examiner presents you with a question like that at the end of the day so the first thing is going into question one what the heck okay give me a sec let me pull this up question one in public sector accounting and finance question one will come from at least two of these things here or three of them that is qualitative characteristics of financial statement accounting basis accounting techniques or approaches measurement basis and then EPSAS issues this is your question one in the exam hall at least two of them will be there for 20 marks or if the examiner gets goosebumps three of them will be in the exam hall so let's do a little deep dive into these quickly the first thing has to do with the qualitative characteristics of financial statements now when it comes to the qualitative characteristics of financial statements you know them already we have the fundamental qualitative characteristics and then the enhancing qualitative characteristics now the qualitative characteristics are simply the key attributes that a set of financial statements must possess to be useful for users of the financial statements and these key attributes can further be divided into two that is the fundamental qualitative characteristics and then the enhancing qualitative characteristics the key question we need to ask ourselves is how will the examiner set a question on fundamental qualitative characteristics there are two ways the examiner can set a question on qualitative characteristics of financial statements all the two he has brought in the exam hall before in the last eight examination dates. the first way is just for the examiner to ask you to describe the qualitative characteristics that a set of financial statements must possess and then you are going to be writing english explaining the qualitative characteristics of financial statements the second way that the examiner can set the question in terms of the qualitative characteristics of financial statement is to hit you with a financial statement with some footnotes and ask you whether the financial statement with the footnotes possess the which of the qualitative characteristics does the financial statement possess and so in that case you are going to be still explaining the qualitative characteristics but in the context of the extra financial statement and the notes provided but that is the idea about the qualitative characteristics of the financial statement so what do we have relevance relevance is one of the fundamental qualitative characteristics which simply states that information both financial and non-financial that will be material which means they will influence the decision making capacity of the users of the financial statement must be recognized and or disclosed in the notes to the financial statement that is what we mean by relevance so any detail at all that provides users of the financial statement further information about the financial statement must be provided to the users to enable them to make a decision so for instance if we are going to buy we are constructing a road 
and we construct a road maybe from Accra to Kumasi and the road was, cons was constructed under a public private partnership arrangement how much did it cost us then how long will the investor take we are going to toll it so how long will the investor toll the road to be able to get their money back yeah if we disclose the infrastructure it, we recognize the infrastructure in our financial statement and we don't disclose details about how long it's going to take for the investor to recoup their investment that is a significant information that the users of financial information must know about so you cannot hide that information from the users so every detail in res details in respect of this road that has been constructed under the public private partnership arrangement must be disclosed in the note to the financial statement so that users can make informed decision about whether we are achieving value for money or not that is the concept of relevance number two is faithful representation the set of financial statements to be prepared by covered entities or the government must represent the economic phenomenon that they purport to represent. What does that mean? It means that the set of the financial statement must be complete, must be free from bias, and must be free from material error. That is what we mean by faithful representation. The financial statement must be complete. All information necessary, all transactions required to be recognized have been recognized. All information required to be disclosed in the notes has been disclosed. Then, um, principal spending officers, principal account holders are going to be exercising judgment in the preparation of the financial statement. The judgment that they exercise, they must not be biased in their judgment. And lastly, the financial statement must be free from material error. Yeah, you can make an error, but the error should not be a material error. That is what we mean by faithful representation. Then we come to comparability. The principle of comparability simply states that the financial statement prepared by a covered entity should be prepared in such a manner that it can be compared to the financial statement of the same entity of the uh, the financial the previous year's financial statement of the same entity or the financial statement of one entity should be comparable with the financial statement of another entity now to achieve comparability of the financial statement it means that there has to be consistency in the application of the accounting standards and accounting principles why because if the ipsas used this year or the accounting policies used used this year are different from the accounting policies used last year then we cannot compare the financial statement when that happens it means we cannot efficiently and effectively evaluate the performance of the covered entity or the performance of the management of the organization but that is the idea about comparability of the financial statement the ability of this of a set of financial statement to be comparable to the a financial statement of the entity from previous years or one entity's financial statement to be comparable with another entity's financial statement but to achieve comparability there must be consistency in the application of accounting principles or accounting policies then we come to timeliness you know that already financial inform fin both financial and non-financial information must be made available as and when needed for decision making in other words the financial information or the financial statement should not be early than it is required earlier than required neither should it be after the decision has been made if not then the information will lose its quality at the end of the day then understandability the financial statement should be prepared in such a manner that it will be simply comprehended by the users of the financial statement verifiability simply means that the financial statement must be supported by source documents to enhance reliability of the financial statement so that is the first part of the discussion qualitative characteristics of the financial statement either the examiner will hit you for you to explain it like this or he will bring a financial statement with some footnotes and will ask you to 
explain the qualitative characteristics of the financial statement which means you are still going to do the explanation but you're going to contextualize it to the question that is given whether relevance has been met whether the financial statement faithfully represents the entity whether comparability is there whether timeliness is there whether the financial statement can easily be comprehended by the users of the financial statement but that is the first thing we must understand that is an area the examiner can throw at you qualitative characteristics of financial statements then we go to the second part which is my favorite area and that is going to be accounting basis accounting basis if you remember we said accounting basis have to do with the recognition of revenue and expenditures simple when we are asked about accounting basis it's about how the entity recognizes revenue and expenditures and so under the accounting basis we have the cash basis we have the modified cash basis we have the accrual basis and then the modified accrual basis cash basis is where revenue is recognized when cash is received expenditure is recognized when cash is paid under the cash basis of accounting capital expenditure will be written off in the statement of financial performance it means there will be no depreciation charge no provision for bad debt when we are using the cash basis of accounting under the um accrual basis which is the opposite of that here we recognize revenue and expenditure not when cash is received or paid but when the transaction takes place which is the default method so under the accrual basis capital expenditure will be capitalized and then depreci depreciated over the economic useful life of the asset that is going to be very important in that particular case provisions are going to be made for bad debt and other expenses that the entity is going to be incurring but these are the two extreme cash basis accrual basis in between that we have what we call the modified cash basis the modified cash basis is just like the normal cash basis only that here the books are left open three months after the year end for transactions that occurred in the previous year which the entity is now receiving payment for or making payment for to be captured in the financial statement so that is the modified cash basis then the last one is the modified accrual basis under the modified accrual basis two things are happening here and the modified accrual basis we are using the cash basis of accounting to recognize revenue and then the accrual basis of accounting to recognize expenditures these are accounting basis the question we then ask ourselves is how would the examiner set a question under the accounting basis he has two options or two strategies to go by that number one he can ask you to just write on these things like i've said compare and contrast so what are the advantages and disadvantages of modified accrual basis or cash basis so he can ask you to just write them like that def defining them the advantages and disadvantages why one is better than the other what are the advantages of adopting accrual basis over the cash basis of accounting so the examiner can throw questions like that at you the second way that the examiner can also set the question is for him to present you with some transactions, some items. Then he will ask you, how should these be accounted for under cash basis? How should be these be accounted for under accrual basis? How should these be accounted for under modified accrual basis? So it depends on how excited the examiner is, but these are the two extremes that the examiner can come from. Like I said, you are going to you may be asked to just write on them all right just write on them the merits and demerits the advantage of one over the other or the examiner presents you with a scenario or with transactions and ask you how should these be accounted for under the cash basis how should these be accounted for under accrual basis in that order so when we talk about accounting basis these are the things we are talking about how an entity is going to recognize revenue and expenditures in its books. 
Then on the flip side, we come to accounting approaches or accounting techniques. These are the methodologies used to keep the financial statements. The methodologies or techniques used in keeping the financial statements. And so under these, we have a couple of things available here. Vault or appropriation accounting, fund accounting, commitment accounting, environmental accounting. We can talk about project accounting. We can talk about um, whatever donor accounting. There are a couple of others available. But what is vote accounting? A vote is simply an amount that has been approved by parliament to be spent. And so vote accounting is where we are keeping the accounts based on the approved budgetary estimates. Based on the approved budgetary estimate. And so if you remember a couple of things we mentioned here, maybe let me pull up my slide on this quickly, if I can, and then see if I can walk you through that briefly. Uh oh. Okay, so give me a sec, let's see. Shots, nope. Um, cruel base is coming. System, okay. So I should be up here. Oh, I don't know why think my slide is delaying I might have to just talk over it and get the heck out of this place okay yeah I think I'm there let's see if I can just talk through you in the slide here so if we look at it carefully what we mentioned was that under vote accounting it looks like we are applying the cash basis accounting principle because here we are keeping the books based on the budgetary estimate that has been approved by Parliament for the most part and so we spoke about the features of vote accounting and how they are supposed to be dealt with generally in that particular case then we come to commitment accounting commitment accounting is where we recognize transaction commitment accounting is exclusively for expenditure items please take note of that very well commitment accounting is exclusively for expenditure item so this is where an expense is recognized evidenced by a contract that has been awarded or purchases order sent to suppliers so once the entity sends purchases orders out or sign a contract with a customer all we do is to move the money we will move the money from the vote into the commitment account and you remember in class we solve a question like that and I told you that a, a question of that structure has not been asked by the examiner yet where you will be required to prepare the vote ledger showing the commitment account, the vote account and then the expenditure account in the ledger like that. The examiner has not asked any question like that before. So that is also hanging in the syllabus. If he gets goosebumps this semester, he can throw it at you. So make sure you review that before you go to the exam hall but that is commitment accounting so immediately we award the contract or we sent out the purchases orders we move the money from the vote into the commitment now when the supplier subsequently supplies the goods and gives us the invoice then we now move the money from the commitment account into the expenditure account but there are two things we mentioned that you need to be mindful of that if the invoice is brought and the amount committed is more than the invoice brought then the excess amount will be re, uh, relinquished into the votes okay so maybe we made a commitment of 10,000 but the supplier supplied all the things we ordered and brought, uh, brought us an invoice of 9,000 okay then we can only take 9,000 into the expenditure account but the thousand remaining will be relinquished into the vote account number two if the supplier for some reason brings us an invoice above the amount we have committed and it is approved by the principal spending officer then 
the amount that has been committed will be transferred from the commitment account into the expenditure account but the excess amount would have to be taken from the vote itself into the expenditure account so that is also the idea about commitment accounting where we are recognizing ac an expenses evidenced by contract that has been awarded or a purchase order that we have sent out fund accounting is on the other hand is where we prepare separate books of account to identify the assets liabilities on each of the funds of the government and you know we have a lot of funds so this is where we will have separate fund for the sinking uh, separate financial statement for the sinking fund the uh road fund the contingency fund the e-levy fund ghana education trust fund all of the funds so we prepare separate books of account for them so that at the end of the day we know the assets liabilities and the balances outstanding on each of the funds that is fund accounting then environmental accounting yeah we are incorporating environmental issues into the uh, accounting system of the government project accounting is also there donor accounting is also there so these are techniques for keeping accounts again the examiner can ask you to write on them right the examiner can ask you to write on them or the calculation question that we did in class where transactions will be given and the examiner will ask us to prepare a vote account sorry a vote ledger where you will have the commitment you have the expenses then you have the votes in and then you do the entries that is also another way that the examiner can bring us a question in respect of these areas so that is also what we must understand about the third area here in our question one so qualitative characteristics accounting basis accounting techniques the fourth thing is going to be measurement basis. At the end of the period, there are elements of financial statements, assets, liabilities, uh, revenue or income, expenses, and then accumulated fund. In the public sector, we don't have equity. What we have is accumulated fund. So these are the five elements of the financial statements. Okay, how do we measure these elements of the financial statements? That is where measurement basis comes to town okay that is where measurement basis comes to town and so we said that measurement has to do with the determination of the monetary value at which a transaction will be carried or an item will be carried in the financial statement whilst recognition is incorporating a transaction into the financial statement of the entity and so what are the measurement basis we spoke about the historical cost so this is where we recognize an asset at the original cost incurred in acquiring the asset or the liability as the amount of consideration transferable at the date of the transaction then we spoke about current cost we said it is the cost that we should we are going to be incurring today if we want to replace an existing asset we spoke about the issue in relation to fair value the value at which an asset can be exchanged or a liability settled within an arm's length transaction among market participants we spoke about value in use that this is the present value of the future cash flows of an asset discounted at the cost of capital of the entity so if we want to continue to use the asset what will be the value in use net realizable value that is going to be the selling price of the asset minus the cost to sell the asset so all of these are measurement basis now how is the examiner going to set the question it depends on whatever he he wants to do he can tell us that oh just write on them that's one way just write on them like okay you are there is a new district that has been created and this is the first time they are preparing financial statements and so they are looking at measuring a couple of items so explain the various basis of measurement for the various elements okay then you are writing the english number two the examiner can present us with some scenarios and will ask you how they should be measured like the question we discussed again in class so if i go back into our book here give me a sec i don't know why this thing is not going through i think my 
Yeah, this question here. It's in the book, okay? It's because it's a past question. The examiner has brought uh, a question of the structure before in that particular case. So, measurement basis of these items and the solution is also there. So, that is also another way the examiner can go. Now, that doesn't mean he will bring the same item of measurement. He will bring other issues. Does that make sense? So, uh, that's why I keep on telling you. If you're looking at the past questions, yeah, look at the past question for looking at its sake. But nothing in the past question will come in the future. Does that make sense? So, if I say, look at this, I don't mean the same thing is going to be there. He, he, if he's going to bring that same structure of question, it's going to be different items. But the principle is measurement basis. Alright? So, when I say, look at this question, what I want you to pick up is, okay, how am I supposed to answer the question? Alright, so we see something here. Okay. What does it say? Human resource software developed by the entity. All right. If the entity developed it, then we can carry it at the historical cost. But if you remember, we mentioned that when it comes to dealing with the measurement basis, there are three things that we would have to be mindful of, which is the cost of service, which is the operational capacity, and then the financial capacity. Because when selecting the appropriateness of a measurement basis for a certain transaction or element, these are the three things that we have to take into consideration. The cost of service, which is the amount of resources to be expended to acquire or develop the asset in question. The operational capacity, which is uh, the information about what services that the assets can help us to offer, then the financial capacity has to do with really how much money can we generate from this asset if we are using it as a collateral facility. So these three things would then guide us to determine the appropriate measurement basis for the asset. So the examiner can bring a question of this structure, but different items, not vehicle donated that no, 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 it won't do like that. He won't go like that but add that items but it is still about measurement basis and the examiner will ask you how should they measure these items and you know it becomes a little bit tricky here if you don't really understand the nature of the specific item in the question then you are likely to give a wrong measurement basis for the most part but that is the idea about the fourth thing that we must understand in the question one, measurement basis. Then suddenly, the fifth part of the question one is going to be some IPSAS issues, which is, I mean, uh, the examiner can throw some IPSAS issues there for you to answer in that particular case. Sometimes he can play with you with some five mark question there on some of the introductory issues like users of public sector financial information, how does government control public sector institutions, and some other skirmishes in the introductory aspects of the syllabus for the most part. But this is our question one for 20 marks. Two of these will be in the exam hall. Which two? Tomorrow morning when you get to the exam or ask the examiner. Just scream on top of your voice. Which two is coming? They, they will bring you the paper. Then you will see the two that will be there. But that is our question one. 20 marks in the exam hall and what we have to look out for. The most important thing, like I said here, is knowing each of these things here. And then number two, the structure of the question and how you are going to approach it so you don't digress so you don't digress again yeah it's good you can refer to the past questions to find out question look at all the past questions from 2019 till november 2023 you can check the question one always these things are the things that are there but every time the questions are of different structure, of different context, that is why I tell you, solving the past question, I'm not saying you are wasting your time, but I don't know, but I don't know. The key thing is to understand the context of the syllabus. 
when you understand the material and how the examiner is likely to set the question and what you should be looking out for and how you should approach the question then whatever the examiner presents to you tomorrow you will be able to write out the answer there so please if you are on a on a drag of yeah Charlie this night I'm gonna go through all the past question ah yeah, yeah. yeah like you're buying unnecessary pressure for yourself that you will die out of if you don't take care so just understand the material okay and go to the exam hall you will be good you'll be good I can guarantee you that you're gonna be good so that's our question one area 20 marks and the things that we need to pay attention to and look at generally um let me know if there is any questions in respect of the question one area any question because i think i saw a couple of questions coming up on this question one area which i have answered oh charlie sometimes i'm trying as much as possible to control some of these things please give me a sec because i mean there is some somebody posting some um garbage in my chat i think it would be better for me to quickly block the person and uh, be able to deal with the issue please give me a sec just give me a moment let's see if i can quickly do this because i don't want my page to be used as an avenue for any scandalous uh activity or behavior oh god <laughs> okay so who the heck okay so block the person that would be better <laughs> okay oh i think i thought it's only one person but i think there are more than one very stupid people like that okay gotta keep my page very clean so I don't have to deal with any problems <laughs> yes Benjamin your hand is up yes uh, please uh, a quick one about the vote ledger uh, you are saying that if you have a difference in the this hold like on, hold on hold on the give commitment me, hold is on hold on give me a sec Yeah, Benjamin, go. Sorry, I think I lost my feet. So, okay, okay, okay. I said uh, about the the vote ledger. Right. Yes, you are a certain example. Like you have a commitment of ten thousand, but when the invoice came, it was nine thousand. Mm -hmm. The difference of the um, the thousand the thousand in the commitment, you have to send it back to the appropriation, right? Yes, or the vote account. Is it what? So you have to send a thousand difference from the commitment back to the appropriation account. Yeah, that's right. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right. Okay, thank you. Um, any other issue for me on the question one perspective? Or oh, we're good, we can get a heck out and continue to question two. Oh goodness. Let's see, what else do I have? I'm seeing another chat coming up here. Let's see if I can take it. Let me bring up my comment pool. Discuss areas that your draft accounting policy will cover, indicating why these areas are important. What is that? You are copying some questions from somewhere for me to answer. 
can you discuss areas that your draft accounting policy will cover indicating why these areas are important like what is the background of this where is it coming from bra jidueben there is a story there i think before this requirement is coming up so this is to this could be a requirement to the question and i don't understand what you are writing come on now oh ready jami ready ready ninye wudeni okay so let's see i'm seeing another comment coming from zoom let's see what do we have innocent please could you show as please could you please could you show as a sample question on how the financial statement will be given to be used in, in explaining the qualitative characteristics no it's a past question that has come before uh it's a part there is a past question like that there i've forgotten the specific year i don't know i think probably july 2023 or something like that it's a past question uh, a, qu a question of that structure has been asked before by the examiner so you can check the past question i don't know um like i said i, I, I can't remember the specific year innocent but you can check through the past questions it should be two examination dates from now so maybe july or march 2023 you'll be able to see that because i don't have it in my slide to pull up for you to see all right so you can just check the past question maybe july 2023 question one or march 2023 one of these should have that there okay all right okay so we good then let's go to question number two okay i think i'm losing my slide here let's see there we go Okay, someone said April 2023. Okay. So, innocent. Someone said April 2023. So, you can check it up. April 2023 from YouTube. So, you can check it up. And one. Okay. These are the things that will be there for your 20 marks for the most part. Okay. For your 20 marks for the most part. Like I said, know the material and whatever question the examiner presents you with you can answer like i keep on telling you don't worry about oh the question no oh, the question no what will come oh no know the material yeah and the spanish right it's a lot of thing how can i read all of these things but you said you want to be a chartered accountant you thought it's what what did you think it was come on now let's go to question two question two is an interesting area there's going to be financial statement preparation please my take for you is this let this be your last or your last but one question please it is a recommendation from a brother to a fellow brother and sisters let this be your last or your last but one question I don't care how smart you think you are i don't care how quick you think you are let this be your last or last but one question and i'm going to tell you why at the end of this session so in question two we are looking at the final accounts preparation and depending on how excited the examiner is we're going to be having the issue in respect of either preparing the accounts for the central bank on the consolidated did i say the central bank sorry the central government that is on the consolidated fund a ministry a department or agency a metropolitan municipal judicial assembly or any other covered entity so it could be a public school a public a public hospital a public transport company or any other covered entity the examiner could ask you to prepare financial statements there all right 
What kind of financial statement will the examiner ask you to prepare? It depends on how excited the examiner is. He will ask you to prepare the traditional guys, which is the statement of financial performance and statement of financial position, or he will ask you to prepare the cash flow statement. It's his jurisdiction. He can decide whatever the heck he wants to do. But that's the question too. Now, there are a couple of things I want you to take away to be able to then excel in the question too. Number one is the fact that you have to be mindful of revenue management and expenditure control. I've told you and I believe that you listen to me and you have rewatched the session three and the session four video on revenue management and expenditure control. Because that topic, revenue management and expenditure control, is an anchor that holds question two, question three, and we can have a dedicated question on that. The topic, revenue management and expenditure control. And I believe that you have rewatched those videos, that is session three and session four, on revenue management and expenditure control. I believe that you are an obedient human being and so you have done it next is going to be ipsas there are a lot of ipsas that examiner is going to be throwing in for us in the notes so that we deal with we deal with it in the financial statement preparation the first one is the ipsas 2 that is going to be inventories the examiner could get some goosebumps and throw some notes at you there all you need to understand under ipsas 12 inventories is that when the entity is valuing an inventory that they are going to be using in-house or an inventory that they're going to distribute at no fee or for no consideration, then that inventory will be valued at lower of cost and re re replacement cost. Lower of cost and replacement cost. So if the Ministry of Health, as always, buy some sanitary parts to distribute, some condoms to, to distribute, what else should they distribute? Um, baby diapers to distribute for free, mosquito nets to distribute. So Ministry of Health distributing all of these things. Okay. They are not getting any money for it, isn't it? So they will value them at lower of cost and replacement cost. So to get a closing stock, of such inventories we compare the cost the historical cost with the replacement cost the lower of the two will become the amount at which the inventory will be carried but if it is an inventory that they are going to sell for a fee then what is going to happen is that that inventory will be valued at lower of cost and net realizable value lower of cost and net realizable value so that is the idea about EPSAS 12 quickly that you have to know about you may go to the exam hall and the kind of question the examiner will bring the entity has no inventory so EPSAS 12 may not be there but for the most part we've seen the examiner throwing EPSAS 12 at us number two EPSA 17 property plants and equipment whether i like it or not he's waiting for you he's smiling for you there property plants and equipment is there so it's there right so you're going to bring in your assets less your depreci uh, accumulated depreciation if there are any additions you're going to add them if there are any disposals you're going to take them out then you're going to charge the consumption of fixed assets for the year or the depreciation for the year and boom you get your carrying amount which will go on the face of the statement of financial position so ipsas 17 is going to be fundamental here ipsas 9 which is revenue from exchange transactions and it associates ipsos 23 revenue from non-exchange transactions again if you watch the video on the revenue management and expenditure control i explained to you this because this is where your footnotes treatment will come in so all of the issues that the examiner is going to be bringing in the footnotes any revenue outstanding any donations grants issues in the footnote their treatment will be dependent on the guidelines in ipsas 9 and ipsas 23 whether they are revenue from exchange transactions and revenue from non-exchange transaction so like i said if you had watched the video revenue management and expenditure control i hope that you now know how the various adjustments will be made then ipsas 4 accounting policies 
Now, what the examiner does for the most part is that he usually brings, he has done that a couple of times, about three or four times, where he brings the Ipsos 4 as a four marks question in relation to accounting policies, changes in accounting estimates and errors. So what should the entity disclose in the notes to the financial statement? That is usually a four marks question that examiner could throw at you in the exam hall in that regard. Then Ipsos 19, impairment and other issues. So when it comes to the question two, the financial statement preparation, like I said, don't worry your head. Oh, what kind of financial statement is coming? Uh -uh. Worry your head. On revenue management and expenditure control be bothered if you still don't understand ipsas 12 ipsas 17 ipsas 9 ipsas 23 ipsas 4 if you don't understand these ipsas that should be your headache don't bother yourself about which question the examiner will bring but that is our question 2 20 marks like i said my recommendation is take this as your last or the last but one question and you know the reason why because of the classification because if you miss the classification of the items you're going to get a lot of things wrong that's the first thing you got to take your time number two because of the punching right the calculation you got to grab your calculator some of you use some calculators that we don't even know where they come from you'll be punching the calculator and be making unnecessary noise in the exam or i don't know where you come from but you know you're gonna be punching so it's gonna require time so you want to do this as your last or last but one question it is my recommendation like I said but if you get to the exam hall and something comes over you and you try to do it as the first one all I can do is to pray for you because 99.9% .9 of the time hands down you're gonna fail the exam because by the time you finish preparing that financial statement, you would have used more than an hour. And at that time, you will start panicking. And when you start panicking, you start failing the exam. And you're going to fail. So please, let this be your last or last but one question. It's just a plea, a plea deal that I'm, you know, trying to reach with you guys. And I hope you're going to do that so that's our question two any questions for me on question two financial statement preparation anything else that you want me to take for you on question two any clarity you would want to seek on question two um quickly let's see if i can pull up our youtube as well here yes felix what you got uh, please, the cash flow. I Can you go through small for the cash flow statement? I then. Can you go? But you wait. We are coming. Kakra my. Come on, say. What say? Me check cash flow. Say see how. At this time, me check cash flow. Hey, Papa. School been out. Go eh. Insurance me check what day. Now teacher been me check what day. Okay. <laughs> so in the cash flow statement, if you remember we discussed this during our revision session but in the cash flow this is where i think that was their last semester i think so in that regard but in the cash flow statement the whole deal is that we are preparing the cash flow statement on cash basis okay on cash basis in other words we are looking at the actual cash inflows and the cash outflows but the key thing here is that we are dividing the various activities of the entity into three major categories so we have the cash flow from operating activities operating activities has to do with a cash flow that relates to the day-to-day -day running of the entity the day-to-day -day running of the entity so we're going to be bringing in revenue items so all the revenue items that the entity is supposed to receive if it is on the consolidated fund then we are talking about direct taxes indirect taxes you know those things grants and donations all those things they are core revenue if it is a covered entity then we are talking about they are decentralized transfers that they have actually received because remember it's on a cash basis then they are internally generated fund that they have 
actually received because remember again the cash basis of accounting is on sorry the cash flow statement is on cash basis all right so their revenue will come then their core expenses are gonna be here core expenses like what compensation of employees goods and services social benefit depreciation is not a cash item thou shall not bring it here you know that already social benefit subsidies that government gives out those things will come under the operating activities because they are the core activities of the entity then we come to the investing activities this is where we are talking about, as the name suggests, acquisition and disposal of assets, right? Acquisition and disposal of assets. So if during the year the entity purchased some PPEs, okay, purchases of PPE, natural purposes, purchases of property, plant and equipment, it's an outflow is an investing activity or if we are coming from the central government perspective they made some equity investments so equity investments during the year or they bought some bonds that's an investing activity does that make sense so that is going to also be there or disposal of any of these things disposal of assets non-current assets disposal of equity investment proceeds from all of those things will come under the investing activities because these are not core things of the entity hence they will come under investing activities right then finally it's going to be financing activities this is where we are talking about loans all right how many loan how much loan did we get okay so loan receipts loan repayments and then interest payment on loan the actual interest that we have paid on loans so under the cash flow from financing activities these are the things that we are looking at and that is the idea about the cash flow statement we are preparing the cash flow statement on cash basis so in operating activities the core things of the entity's activity comes there investing activities anything that relates to capital investment acquisition and disposals of assets come there equity investment and all that comes there then under financing activities any loans that has been received uh, during the year or loans repayments that will also be there then interest payment will also be there so that is the idea about the cash flow statements for the most part um so that came from who the heck felix i think so let me know if that makes sense for you there all right what else do i have say on cash flow statement which method is advisable to use now we are going with a normal approach indirect method yeah we know there is direct and indirect but this approach here is the indirect method the normal one okay so that's that's the deal but i don't know the context of your method issue uh that's from philemon i don't know the context of your method issue uh in that particular case but you can give me some idea is are you talking about the direct and the indirect method or what method like you start with the net operating results and then you do the adjustment is that what because that is also another m approach that some people could use but this is the default way you go uh in that regard so i don't know if you you get my explanation or you can give me some context as well in that case um okay so give me a moment okay philemon said yes direct and indirect mostly when preparing the for a covered entity no so we go with the indirect method the pro forma i explained here is the indirect method which is the default method right where you are bringing the uh, decentralized transferred in the um, internally generated fund and all of those things then 
their expenses will flow in goods and services that they have paid for employees that they have paid social benefits and all of those things so that, that that's the indirect method the default presentation okay so i believe we are good with the question too i don't know i'm seeing a chat coming up here daniel said sorry it is april 2022 not 2023 oh, okay so innocent that was to your earlier question about the <coughs> qualitative characteristics thing i think he said it's rather april 2022 not 2023 also then can you touch on ipsas for how the treatment is done accounting policies changes in accounting estimates and errors that's a huge thing i can't teach that now Th there's a video about that on the on the channel that you can watch if you want to but that is a, a huge thing that uh i cannot touch on in much detail right now because really accounting policies changes in accounting policies are applied retrospectively changes in accounting estimates are applied prospectively if there is prior period error it is also applied prospectively that's what i can say in that particular case then when it comes to uh, issues that we have to disclose in the notes to the financial statement in respect of uh, how the financial statement was prepared, then we have to talk about the accounting policies we used, uh, the rules that we applied, the P uh, the Public Financial Management Act 2016, Act 921, um, the chart of account of the government of Ghana, how the assets were depreciated and all of those things. So if you want details on the standard, I think we have a video on that on the on the youtube channel as well uh you can watch that to get a full detail but the general thing here is that when there's a change in accounting policy it is uh, going to be applied retrospectively when there's change in accounting estimate it's going to be applied prospectively retrospective means like it will affect the current year and previous year's financial statement then uh prospectively means that we are going to be applying to just the current financial statement and future financial statements as well in that case okay so let's go to question ibasa number three what's wrong here okay so let's go to question number three Question three, it's about evaluation of financial statements or if you want performance measurements. And they are divided into two here. The first one is measuring the efficiency and effectiveness of the public financial management system by the government. Measuring the efficiency and effectiveness of the public financial management system by the government and the way we measure the efficiency and effectiveness of the public financial management system of the government is what we it's where we use the pifa framework so this is where pifa comes in and so yes under pifa there are a couple of ways that the examiner can set the question that we need to be mindful of there is a theory part of pifa that the examiner can throw you at under the theory this is where we are talking about the seven pillars okay or talking about the principles of an orderly and open public financial management system and there are six of them so there's a difference between the seven pillars and then the six uh, principles of the uh, open and orderly public financial management system I told you about the difference and then we could also have issues in, in again still in the theory about the importance or objectives of the PIFA framework and its uses so from a written or comment perspective the examiner can come from these angles for us okay the examiner can come from these angles for us and it is important we know about them the seven pillars and like someone asked earlier should i do it in an in an order no you're not supposed to do anything in any order 
uh, the way you remember it you can write it up because it's not really in any order generally but it'll be good for you to put it in that order that's it so what am i saying do it in order <laughs> Yeah, but if you don't remember the order, just, you know, write it up the way you remember and go away. But the examiner will really be excited and you can get the full marks uh, allocated, uh, available if you're able to, you know, put it in order. So, learn it in order. But like I said, if in the exam or your brain is messing up with you, oh, like you remember it, but you don't know if it is pillar three or pillar four or whatever. Just write it down. The examiner will have me pat your back and say oh i got you my daughter i got you i got you yeah it is four marks but because you didn't arrange it in order i'll give you 3.5 yeah that's okay right so yeah it's good to arrange it in order but if you can't get it why not just keep it simple and go away so budget reliability transparency of public finance uh management of assets and liability policy based data data da, and all that and then the other thing that i was talking to you about earlier yeah, the critical that now please be mindful of the the way this statement is be mindful of the way this statement is so if the examiner asks you to write on the pillars okay used to evaluate public financial management system then you are going with the seven pillars here but there is also another type of question that the examiner could bring to you which is this statement here critical performance dimension of an open and orderly public financial management system critical performance dimensions now like i said they look like the pillars but there is a little difference between them just a little difference because here you're talking about credibility comprehensiveness and transparency policy base predictability and control accountability recording and reported and then external scrutiny and audit so pay attention to the critical performance dimensions of an open and orderly public financial management system and the seven pillars if there's someone asks you for seven pillars and you go and write the critical that's digression like it's called au revoir mes oui. and if there's someone asks you for the critical performance and you come in Talk about the seven pillars. Another au revoir, mes oui. Now, au revoir, mes oui, not au revoir, mes oui in full, but au revoir, mes oui in half. Because, yes, I I in principle, they have some relationship just with a minor distinction between them. So, please make sure you pay attention to that as you try to read. So, on the theory part, the seven pillars, the critical dimension, uh, performance dimensions of open and orderly public financial management system the importance objectives of public of the pifa framework what's going on with my feed freezing is it my feed freezing or my sound which is which uh l let me know is my sound freezing or it's my video that is freezing which is which let me know if i have to change my network or something like that because i think i'm getting a bad feedback from my presentation here i see that my slide pauses some time the second part of the pifa okay the sound is what freezes okay both sometimes whoa vodafone people now that they are telesale i'm hoping that there'll be something better for the country vodafone people if you work in vodafone tell them they should do our network well <laughs> all right then we come to the calculation perspective stay with me carefully stay with me carefully here so the examiner can dance with you it's a 10 marks area for your information and depending on how excited the examiner is, either you go theory or you go calculation part. Okay. So under the calculation, what options do we have available? Stay with me. Number one is the examiner can ask you to prepare the statement of budget performance. Okay. Statement of budget performance. 
assessing the performance of the organization using the PIFA. Remember the question we solved in class, the Etum District Assembly question. If the examiner wants you to use the PIFA to analyze or prepare the statement of financial performance and analyze, then, sorry, statement of budget performance and analyze, then the examiner will give you the indicators, the results for performance, so that when you now pr do your statement, you bring your budget, you bring your actual, you get your variance in currency, then you get your or out ten or rather, let me pull it that way. Out ten in currency, and then out ten in percentages, so that you now have the score at the final column. Okay, you have the score at the final column. Question two, sorry, question three. That's what we are talking about. Now, if the examiner is asking you for this. As part of the question, he will give you the indicators that, oh, if the score is between this and this, is A. If the score is between this and that, is B. If the score is between this and that, is C. If the score is between this and that, is D. In that case, you prepare your statement of financial performance, have the score there. Like I said, a similar question of that is the Etum District Assembly question we solved in class. I am emphasizing on this because of the things some of you did in the mock, which I've told you about already. So I just want to repeat that so that it sinks in your head. And you get to the exam where the examiner asks you, analyze the performance of the organization. He didn't say use PIFA. Then you go and use PIFA. 10 marks, au revoir, mesue. It's gone. So be careful. So we could be asked to prepare the statement of... Uh, Budget performance, use the PIFA to analyze the performance of the entity. The second one is to go with the analysis where we use the weakest link or the average method, right? And you remember the distinction between the two, right? So let's talk about them quickly. When it comes to the PIFA, we have A, B, C, D. Then we have four, three, two one please stay with me carefully because this is going to save you in the exam or if the examiner gets goosebumps about this so when we are using the weakest link method we use the alphabet for the scoring but when we are using the average method we use the numbers for the scoring what does that mean? Now, weakest link is where a negative score in a dimension writes off a positive score in another dimension of the same indicator. That's the weakest link. But with the average method, this is where we take the average of all of the dimensions to get the score for that indicator. So you got to be careful. If we are in the weakest link, we use the alphabet. Now, if we are using the alphabet, the way you do the scoring is to always start with the lowest. And then if there are other higher scores, you add a plus to it. So let me give you an example. Let's say that we are looking at, let's say we are looking at something. Let me bring up something here. Let's go back to the PIFA situation here. Mm, what are we looking at? Let's say we are looking at budget reliability. Okay, this is under budget reliability. So let's say for, for some reason we are using the weakest link. And so let's say that uh, aggregation of R10, let's say it has a score of, say, um, C. And then this has, has a score of A. And let's say this one has a score of B. And we are using the weakest link. The rule is that you start with the lowest now again if you look at a b c d the lowest is d c b and a it goes in that order so if i come back to my illustration here among these three which one is the lowest is the c so we start our scoring from c but as you can see the other dimensions here 
have a higher score a and b for that reason the score for the budget reliability will be c plus but remember a means very good b means good c means d means boing boing so poor performance and so if i come back to my illustration this is c plus it means that the budget reliability of the covered entity is what average does that make sense that is the weakest link method now if i should go to another one let's say i'm going to management of assets and liability and we have these indicators here debt management you know the debt management of this country is very very poor so let's say that is d okay public asset management oh, that's also not good let's say c public investment that's also very boring boring let's give it b fiscal risk reporting i think they do a bit a better job there whatever the heck a still we are using the weakest link so what is the lowest here is d so the score is going to be d now although there are other higher scores we don't do d plus just say d it's poor performance for the most part so when we are using the weakest link that is how we do the scoring always start with the lowest and then if there are other positive indicators apart from d then you add a plus to it but that plus doesn't change the name it will still fall within whatever uh, performance measurement we are going to be using in that regard if it is an average method then we're going to use the numbers does that make sense if the average method we're going to use the numbers and get the average see who okay yeah my stream has resumed okay i don't know what's wrong with vodafone people tonight charlie the are in the have a provision for bad day too now you're called say a pong cry say a chitty give me a moment Um, let's see. I don't know what's wrong with Vodafone tonight. Probably I gotta change my network or something like that to another thing. Um, what do I have? What do I have? What do I have? One, two, one, two, one, two. Oh, okay. It's my, it's my, well, I don't know, stream still breaking. Let me know. So that if it is possible, I have to change my network. <laughs> this you wait till after question four is done <laughs> is my stream still breaking uh so that i can see if i have to change my network because i don't know it's i think i should be good now right so we can go it's better now okay all right so let's go i'm hoping that Vodafone people will not screw me up tonight. Let's go. Okay, what 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 would I say? I was talking about the average method. So, in the average method, let's say we are looking at policy-based fiscal strategy and budgeting, and under that there are indica three indicators that we are looking at, and so we have A, B, and C. So what do we do? We will do A, and we are using the average method. So we'll do A plus b plus c over three because there are three items now what is a we've said a is four what is b b is three what is c c is two so divided by three what do i have that would be nine divided by three and that would be three so my average is three where does three fall three means a score of B so it means that the policy based fiscal strategy budgeting system the fourth pillar has a good what performance so that is how we use 
the weakest link in the average method when it comes to dealing with these items. And that's about PIFA. We're done. So, either the examiner will take you through theory parts, talk, 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 or ask you to prepare the statement of budget performance, like this pro forma, and it will give you the scoring indicators in the question. I'm emphasizing on this, so the scoring indicators will be given to you in the question. Then you use that to score. When you are done, you write a report about it to explain whether it's good, if it is good. And I've told you the guideline for explanation of the things. You state what is happening. Okay, what's the score? It's B. What does B mean? Good performance. Why is that? This could be because of da 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 da. You state some of the reasons. Okay, what are the implications of it? Da 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 da. You state it down. So either the examiner will go with the statement of budget performance or weakest link average method, and you're going to be again analyzing the efficiency and effectiveness of the public financial management system. The good news is. All of these have been asked by the examiner on cyclical basis over the last eight examination diet. So tomorrow, he can choose whatever he wants to bring to you and he should be in the position to be able to answer it. But that is the principle and what you must understand about PIFA. 10 marks waiting for us in the example. Any questions, um, follow up, something, clarity about FIFA or we got to say au revoir may sway to that any questions or we good let's see if I got some chats coming up on YouTube okay no it's fine all right that's that's fine all right okay we good all right so that's our question three the first part PIFA the second part of question three, it's going to be evaluation of financial statements. Evaluation of financial statements. And there are three methods that can be used. Common size analysis, ratio analysis, budget variance analysis. One of these will be in the exam hall. Good news, all of them have been asked by the examiner. So again, you got to know all of them. And you're going to get to the exam hall, you know what you're going to do, right? Now, in common size analysis, what did we say? In common size analysis, you are just re-preparing the financial statement, converting it into percentages. So when it comes to the statement of financial performance, the total revenue becomes the basis. So you are just changing the whole financial statement, the individual items, into percentages. And the total revenue becomes the basis. So as you are going to have, let's say it's a covered entity, so you're going to have decentralized transfer. You're going to have, um, what else? Internally generated fund. You're going to have grants and donations. So let's say this is 1,000. This is 2,000. This is 5,000. So it means the total revenue situation, it's going to be 8,000. Okay, you're just converting that into percentages. And the total revenue is the basis. So one eighth times 100, what do I have? One eighth times 100, whatever, 12.5%. Uh, 2 over 800, that's 25%. And then fifth, eight, ooh, ooh, ooh. that's 62.5%. And it should be equal to 100. That's common size. Then on the expenditure part also, so when I come to expenditure, you know goods and services, you know compensation of employees, um, what else, whatever, social benefits, whatever. Again, let's say we have some figures up, 6,000, um, 8,000, oh, whatever, 4,200, you have 2,000 here. Again, the total revenue is the basis. When you're doing statement of financial performance, the total revenue is the basis. So what do we do? To get the goods and services in percentages, it's going to be 6,000 over the 
total revenue 8,000 times 100. And that's 75%. And what happens is that on the expenditure part, it will either be more than 100 or less than 100. For the most part, it is going to be more than 100. But that is the statement of financial performance. If the examiner says we should prepare the common size statement for the statement of financial performance. In the statement of financial position, it's still the same idea. But here, total assets becomes the base that we will use to convert all the figures into percentages. The idea about common size analysis, for instance, when we are analyzing the statement of financial performance, is to look at the percentage of the total revenue of all of the individual items. So for instance, when I come to the expenditure analysis, goods and services, I got 75%. What it means is that 75% of the total revenue generated by the entity is used to finance goods and services, which will mean that less revenue will be available for compensation of employees, social benefits, and even capital expenditure by the entity. That's how you do the interpretation, and that is the meaning of what we are doing when it comes to common size analysis. If we look at the revenue scenario, you realize that decentralized transfers, 12%, grants, uh, IGF, 25%, grants and donations, 62.5%. What does that mean? It means that the entity is over-relying it means that the entity is over relying on grants and donation to finance its activities or its operations. And that is not good because when government or a covered entity is over relying on grants and donation to finance its activities, you know the implication, right? Because that means there will be foreign influence on our economic policy and everything and, you know, Recently, the things that are already ongoing, LBGTQ plus nonsense going on and all of those things. Yeah, like, hey, don't pass, don't ascend to the bill because we're going to use, lose 3.8, you know, billion dollars. Yeah, because if you are relying a lot on another country, other foreign entities to fund your budget, you can't be yourself. So everything you do, you'll be at their mercy. So that is what the statement of financial performance is telling us. What is the percentage of total revenue of each of the individual items? Why are they happening that way? And then what are the implications on the entity's performance or on the entity's operation as well as on national development and all of those things? So these are the things that we must understand about common size analysis. The examiner has brought it once. I don't know if March 2024 you will get excited to bring it again. But the area that the examiner has enjoyed a lot is ratio analysis. I mean, it's the area that he has enjoyed a lot. He has brought it over and over again. That's ratio analysis. And you know the ratios. You're going to be calculating the ratios. And then you interpret the ratios. And so, again, the interpretation part is the key thing here and i believe you remember the pro forma if it is a report to from subject date intro body conclusion thank you yours faithfully signature your name if it is not a report and we are just writing an analysis then we have the heading but intro comes body comes conclusion comes thank you pro forma is very key and I've told you this, you've done it, whether I like it or not, you're going to be writing analysis. Upe, upe, you're going to write it. So, better make sure you review your analysis. Now, in the introduction part, like I tell you always, keep it sweet, simple, straight to the point. What does that mean? Tell us what the heck this analysis is about. Um, what are the basis of comparison you're using? What is the year ended you are using? Keep it sweet, simple, straight to the point. Then, after that, you come to the body, and then you start writing your analysis out in your conclusion paragraph you tell us about the overall performance of the entity and then some recommendations or suggestions that you are going to make to improve upon either revenue generation or expenditure control or some of the challenges that you have identified in the question so that is also the second part of our question three for 10 marks 
either it will have common size or the ratio analysis or the third one is the budget variance analysis which is what we saw in our mock where some of you were using the PIFA principle to do the interpretation for that right so that is budget variance analysis um, like I said the examiner has brought all of these up so in tomorrow which one is it gonna bring I don't know he can bring any of them in that particular case so that is the idea about that so that's it about evaluation of financial statement as well any questions um any follow-up any clarity specifically in respect of common size ratio analysis budget variance analysis anything that's 10 marks there um sir so sorry for bothering you can you once again enclose some of the things that goes under financing activities we are saying that loan receive loan repayment then interest expenses paid during the year that's what comes under the financing activities loan received loan repayment and then the interest payment on debt that we did during the year so those are the things that comes under the financing activities um i hope we are okay so that's question three area so question three pifa and evaluation um again i would want you to come to this pretty later on in your discussion because i mean if the examiner brings you anything about the evaluation 10 marks it means you're going to use 18 minutes but by the time you do the calculation and do the interpretation you may need more than 18 minutes so i will also recommend that you don't do this at the beginning all right so my strategy for you is you take the question one because it's going to be written aspect for the most part and then you come to question four and then you go to question five which is going to be no mass land area the examiner is going to throw things at you there so once you pick all of those areas the ones you can answer making sure that you are answering each question on a fresh page then you can come to the question three do the calculation and write your interpretation go to the question two try to do your classification and go and extract the financial statement in that particular case so these are the things that we must understand in respect of this one um let's see do i have any questions on the question three situation um i'm seeing some chats coming up on youtube let's see if i can get them coming in um i think you when I saw the name of Afenio, something came into my head. That's why I'm laughing. Okay, so Afenio Bismarck said, difference between retrospective and prospective. <laughs> okay. Retrospective means that the change in the accounting policy is going to be applying this year and previous year. So the entity would have to go back to previous year's financial statement. Maybe last year financial statement and last two years financial statement and amend them so that i mean the change in accounting estimates that uh, change in accounting policy that has been adopted this year it's like we had used it in those years that is called retrospective application prospective application usually applies in accounting estimates and so that one it affects the current year and future financial statements that is prospective application so that's the difference between the two uh afenio Bismarck. can the common size be on statement of financial position yes that is what i just said so in the statement of financial position the total asset becomes the basis so you're going to change all the elements in the statement of financial position into percentages using the total asset figure as the basis so all the line items will be changed into percentages 
using the total asset as the basis so when we go to the statement of financial position we are looking at what is the percentage of each of the line item of the total assets of the entity so yes we can have statement of financial position what the examiner brought the uh, about common size was statement of financial performance because that is really what can be well understood nonetheless the statement of financial position is also there because it's in your syllabus so you have to know about it so that was frank dramani okay frank dramani um what else do i have i guess we go on the question three situation okay let's go to question um number four Lop. question number four is an interesting area that is where people were trying to hit me with some things when i got excited earlier question four will be two things 10 marks on public procurement 10 marks on public private partnership arrangement <laughs> and so that was where people were hitting me oh public procurement it's voluminous oh which area should i learn oh learn everything <laughs> oh Jira. you know when you learn in cra it's not sticking yeah you are not learning well <laughs> it's not funny but you know so that's what i when i hear some of these things and i read some of these things th there is no shortcut i have to understand everything so what was the deal here a couple of things you got to make sure you are mindful of i think someone also asked me for the method situation earlier so let me bring up the public procurement slide i have a slide on the public procurement like this um i don't know probably we could share this slide with you guys if you want to so that you can at least have something but you know when it comes to public procurement there's a lot yes it's a lot L look at the things here plenty but 10 marks pay i you said you want to be a chartered accountant what do you think you want me to come and tell you oh focus on this oh read on this i'm not the examiner i don't know the examiner so i can't tell you which way where to learn so you have to learn everything okay yeah it's a lot you have to learn I don't know where it's coming if i know where it's coming i would have told you so that you just learn that one then we go but i don't know okay so just learn everything there but the first thing has to do with the structure of public procurement the structure the examiner can bring a question on the structure where will he will ask you what are the roles or duties of the public procurement authority what are the roles of the head of a public procurement entity what are the roles of uh entity tender committee or the entity the tender evaluation panel or the tender review committee the examiner can bring you a question like that he has done that a couple of times he can bring that to you on the structure on the structure right then we go to the methods and so this is where um someone was asking me about earlier on zoom i think so i don't know if that was felix or somebody like that so the methods the, the methods are the area that the examiner has really examined a lot i have to say a lot um more than any part of this public procurement topic the methods okay the methods i don't know why but it looks like the examiner is excited about them but you know it's it's an area the examiner can set a question on so really the methods are in two we have the competitive tendering and then sole or single source please make sure you get a difference between the two sole sourcing sole 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 proprietor so 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 sourcing means throughout the world only one person is there in the whole country only one person is available to offer that particular services and so we go to that person that is called sole sourcing single source there are a lot of suppliers there are a lot of contractors but the entity elect 
to buy from a specific supplier that is called single source i hope you get a difference because some of you screw this up a lot but that's the difference generally now using these requires an approval from the public procurement authority okay because you cannot just get up and say i'm using single sources you got to write to the public procurement authority and say hey listen i got to use single source here although there are a lot of suppliers i want to go buy from this particular supplier because i mean he is good to us so we want to go and buy from that supplier and the public procurement authority will give the green light then the entity will go and buy but there are reasons why we could use the single source method so that although there are many buyers uh sorry many sellers many contractors the entity will elect to buy from a specific supplier so there are a couple of reasons available we've discussed these things then the limitations of the single source the disadvantages of the single source we discuss these things as well it's something the examiner can throw at you it's part of the methods of procurement then we come to the competitive tendering which is really the real deal for the most part uh in that particular case and under that we're going to talk about the general method if you remember i told you that the procedure for competitive tendering i don't think in my you know small knowledge i don't think the examiner will ask you to do that but he could ask you for 10 marks blank like that describe the competitive tendering process oh, oh oh 10 marks that would be nice and we discussed this right i mean development or preparation of the tender document publication of the tender document pre-qualification right uh, acceptance of uh, receiving the bids or proposals evaluation of the bids of the proposal we award the contract then the contract is administered so this is the procedure for the competitive tendering but what i told you basically is that sometimes the examiner may not ask you for this whole thing but he may remove a portion of it and ask you a question about it and so you have to know about that very well for instance pre-qualification what are some of the things that we are looking for are there basic qualification that a supplier must have before bidding for government projects it's a question the examiner can ask you and we have discussed this i mean the person should be paying their taxes they should be contributing to the pension scheme of their employees they should have financial capacity because for the most part the entity will be the one to execute the project and later on be paid by the government and so they must have some money in their bank they must have the technical qualification for the job they must be registered company that kind of thing so like those things there then we said the competitive tendering can be divided into two open and limited under the open this is where we have that information that i think felix asked about earlier um, national competitive tendering international competitive tendering now the method to be used depends on the threshold so uh i don't know i don't remember if it was felix or so the threshold issue that you were asking about this is it so if we are dealing with goods works and services up to 10 million 15 million 5 million respectively then we're going to use the national competitive tender which means that only Ghanaian uh, or companies in Ghana can bid for that contract but anything above 10 million 15 million 5 million for goods works and services respectively we're going to use international competitive tendering which means that uh both companies in ghana and companies outside of ghana can bid for that contract and so if you remember we said that depending on how excited the examiner is he could ask us to write this in a written format or he could ask us to suggest a procurement method based on a certain project that the entity wants to undertake then we spoke about retri uh, restricted tendering discuss the various issues that we must understand there request for quotation method you know here we said that oh it's a normal thing we know what we are going to be doing already so we just request for quotation from the suppliers and then we give the contract to uh whoever that will give us value for money and normally if the contract is anything below 100,000 Ghana CD for goods 200,000 for works 
150,000 for services, then we have to use the request for quotation for that particular thing that we want to procure. Two stage tendering, the procurement entity does not have the specifications of what they seek to procure and so the procurement process is divided into two stages the stage one is the invitation of proposal where people who have the expertise in that particular industry the suppliers and contractors there they will supply uh, or they will provide specification of the product to the procurement entity then the procurement entity use that to now prepare the tender document and that is where we go to the stage two invitation of tenders so that they can now bid and send their proposal with price in the first stage they just bring out the specification without any cost information but in the second stage they can now send their proposal with cost information so i gave an example that let's say we want to buy a laptop and distribute the laptop to the teachers and so we don't know what kind of laptop should we use is it should it be an ios laptop should it be a windows laptop or uh whatever a linus laptop okay what should be the screen size we don't know what should be the ram what should be the storage we don't know okay if we want to go for windows what kind of windows laptop should we go for that kind of thing so the entity lacks the specification but they want laptop so stage one people who sell laptop will furnish the procurement entity with details about all the available available options then the procurement entity will now base on that to now prepare a tender document and invite them to now bid for the project with their cost information and quotations and so this is a question that we discussed that the examiner has brought before so there are a number of things that the entity is seeking to procure so based on the value which procurement method can the entity use and so that like i said the examiner can come in from the theory part where we are explaining the methods or can present us with a scenario like this and ask us which method will be appropriate and in that case we have to look at the value of the contract to determine whether the entity should use request for quotation competitive uh, national competitive tendering or international competitive tendering and so like we've discussed all of these things in that particular case what the heck is that sorry okay so these are the issues that we spoke about then certainly there are some other issues if i go back to my slide here the print one of the trick I told you was that when it comes to the principles of public procurement, it's a question the examiner can ask you. We have value for money, we have accountability, we have transparency. Those are the same principles also under um, my feed has frozen again. Oh the heck. All right. Those are the same principles under how do we call it um public private partnership arrangement so if the examiner asks you to explain the guiding principles of public private partnership arrangement value for money accountability transparency ability to pay local content and so these three guys is the same in public procurement you just have to know how you contextualize the explanation in public procurement and then if the examiner should ask you principles or guiding principles or guiding rules of public pro, uh, private partnership the same principles can be mentioned and then you explain them in the context of public private partnership arrangement so the principles the examiner can ask you disposal of government stores the examiner has brought it like two or three times um it's an area that you have to know about then procurement of consultants then there are other things also like established practices risks associated with public procurement it's something that the examiner has not really been excited about over the last eight examination diets so the risks associated with public procurement the offenses in public procurement so these are areas that you want to really make sure that in addition to everything you are reading you really look at them well because the examiner can throw a job at you as you go into the exam or and make sure that you can block it because you have read it so the risks associated with public procurement is something you need to know about offenses 
public procurement you have to know about then you know complain dealing with complaint we we spoke about the way complaints are dealt with so there's a lot of things going on here yes i get it but you got to know all of them right you got to know all of them because we don't know where the examiner is going to come from it's just 10 marks but there's a lot going on there it's just 10 marks but there's a lot going on there so these are the things we must understand generally about public procurement now under this i think somebody asked a question let's see if i can just go there and take that particular thing public procurement um if i remember what was it um, so i'm just going into my slide to take something from the not necessarily my slide this is the book my public sector book okay yeah somebody asked a question about margin of preference i don't know i think that was from gideon at the beginning of the discussion or something like that was it margin of preference yeah margin of preference so there are a couple of other terminologies that you need to understand like tender security margin of now margin of preference a procurement entity may grant a margin of preference for the benefit of tenders for work by a domestic contractor or for the benefit of tenders for domestically produced goods or for the benefit of domestic suppliers of services the margin of preference shall be calculated in accordance with the public procurement in accordance with the procurement regulations and reflected in the records of the procurement proceedings the margin of preference shall be authorized by the board or you know the authority and be subject to the approval by the board so if an entity is a procurement entity is using the international competitive tendering which means that foreigners uh sorry companies outside ghana are going to bid for the contract and then locals companies in ghana are also going to be bidding for the contract now what happens if you remember i told you this that no matter what happens it is important we find out although we are using international competitive tendering can we get a local firm to do the job because that way the money stays here that way the money stays here and so a little preference will be given to those domestic people who are bidding for the contract now that preference is what is referred to as the margin of preference so that when we are doing the evaluation of the attender documents that will be like an, ad an added bonus to them even before we start with the analysis of whether they qualify so once we meet the qualification that will be like a plus to them so that if we have two companies one is a foreign company one is a Ghanaian a resident company in Ghana then and they all qualify we will give the job to the Ghanaian company it's because of their concept of the margin of preference so that like I said we will want the money we will pay to the contractor to remain in Ghana rather than giving the money to the foreigner who will take it out of the country in that in that particular case so that is the concept of margin of preference uh, an indicator that is used to prioritize uh, bids received from domestic suppliers in the evaluation process so that preferably they can meet the criteria required so the job or the contract can be awarded to them so that is the concept about the margin of preference and like i said that was a question that someone asked earlier and it's under evaluation okay that's why i said it is done under the evaluation method okay so that's about public procurement i'm done any questions about that any follow-up Oh, should I, you know, it's plenty. And hmm, you read that? Hmm, should I, hmm, you don't know, eh? Hmm. Be there, be there. Be there, be doing hmm, hmm, hmm. And don't go in there. Yeah, 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 yeah. You say you want to be a chartered accountant. You think it's a joke. You 
think that it's easy to be a chartered accountant. Nick, it's plenty. How can I learn all these things and put it in my head? Eh? It's not fair. It's not fair. You the every day the world is not fair. The day the world will be fair for you, you will die. And since that day has not come, you will enjoy all the fair unfairness. Ah till that day comes. <laughs> All right, so I think somebody was raising a chat in uh, on YouTube about the offenses. I mean, so these are a couple of things here about the offenses. For instance, entering or attempting to enter a collusive agreement. It's an offense, right? Directly or indirectly influencing in the manner or attempting to influence in any manner the procurement process. It's an offense. Altering any procurement document with intent to influence the outcome it's an offense insertion of documents such as a bid security or tax clearance certificates which were not submitted at the time of the bid opening if that's an offense because at the time of bid opening all documents necessary has to be attached so that at the bid opening when we open your bid and there are certain documents that is supposed to attach it is not there that bid is put into the dustbin asa but if somebody passed behind the scene and at the time of the bid closing uh yeah the closing of the bid and opening of the bid that has been received maybe tax clearance certificates or their bid security is not ready and they pass behind the scene and give somebody brown envelope so that later on we will bring it that's an offense that's an offense. Now, bid security, I think I've told you about this. I mean, it's the guarantee that the, proc the supplier or the contractor is giving to the procurement entity uh, as to how they're going to raise money for the financing of their activity. That's the bid security. So, you know, th this was one of the concerns that caused PDS to be out of the system because they offered a tender security or a bid security, which will include bank guarantees um, and other documents in terms of financing but later on when it was checked they realized that uh -uh, all of those bank guarantees and everything was just au revoir me sweet so that was why the PDS contract was cancelled and ECG came back to come and take over and now they just switch off the lights by heart by heart including parliament house these people don't have respect how can you turn the light off in parliament like if it is a country like some countries maybe some so like who gave that that authority go to the parliament house turn off their lights because they owe electricity bill it's not good crap but you know we move so these are some of the offenses uh that we can talk about and that was a question coming in from someone on youtube okay so that's it about the a aspects of the question four the b aspect of the question four is public private partnership arrangements okay public private partnership arrangements <coughs> there um please is there a difference between tender security and uh, performance security no they work in the same way uh they are all guarantees offering on how the project is going to be financed and executed for the most part uh just that there's a slight difference the performance security gives a guarantee that if the work is not done in a manner or one party cancels the contract there will be a certain penalty that will be paid. Like, for instance, that useless thing that they are doing, the National Cathedral that they are constructing, um, that the work has stopped, per the terms of the contract, allegedly, although the contract has stopped over the last whatever years, the contractor will still be paid some amount of money. Although job has stopped, that's part of the performance security. If, you know, maybe... The contractor will go to the bank and take some money. So if you stall the project, the, the, that gives them security that you will still give them their money, although you've stalled the project. 
So that relates to the performance. And then the tender security has to do with them giving a guarantee of how they are going to be getting the necessary funding to be able to execute the project. So that is just a slight difference between the two. Today, some people went to the pit that they were going to inaugurate the national <laughs> national cathedral. <laughs> this country is an interesting area. It is an interesting place to be in. So the last part is public-private partnership arrangements. It's an interesting area as well. And um, if you remember, let me see if I can bring my slide up on this as well public private partnership do i have a slide on this give me a sec let's see if i can pull a slide on this one yeah i got a slide on this okay now public private partnership there are a lot of things there okay the examiner can ask you questions about the limitations the principles the objectives, the types, and the exceptions. These are the five issues. One of them or two of them will be in the exam hall. I don't know which one will be there, but these are the things. Limitations, objectives or importance, the types, okay, or models, the principles, and the contract outside the scope of the public private partnership arrangement so these are the things now when it comes to the principles i've told you there's a lot here the examiner can ask you there is something that the examiner hasn't asked yet and that is the risks the types of risk the, i think the examiner has not really done uh justice to that part so i don't know you, you got to be mindful of that as part of the things that you read construction risk availability risk demand risk residual risk financing risk you know maintenance and operational risk these are the types of risks in public private partnership arrangements so the examiner can ask you about that so please make sure you go over that, over that very well and it's risks allocation is one of the principles under public private partnership arrangement we have value for money we have risks allocation what else we got ability to pay you know we've explained this over and over again that if the private investor is going to be getting his money back then he will charge the people but we have to look at the ability of the people to be able to pay Bef you can you have to determine the ability to pay local content and then transfer of knowledge and skills so these are some of the issues that we can talk about in terms of the principles so know the principles and i've shown you a trick that value for money transparency accountability those same principles are also in public procurement right then when it comes to ppp ability to pay will be added local content will be added risk allocation will be added so that's the trick there but remember under the risk allocation the types of risk the examiner can throw you tomorrow as you go there for five marks to explain the types of risks that are uh that ppp projects are exposed to he can ask you that for five marks and you should be able to write these things we've spoken about them so you should be able to do that what else the types okay the types the types the types are in twofold number one the examiner can ask you to write english explain the types or number two he can give a question and will ask you which model or type of ppp will be appropriate okay so know the english and because you remember we solved a question like that it's a past question that the examiner brought so the examiner can bring you a question like this just like how in procurement he can bring a scenario and ask you which method of procurement will be appropriate in public private partnership also he can bring you some scenarios give you the features of the transactions or the contract or the project and ask you to recommend which public private partnership method will be appropriate and why he's still talking about the methods but this time around there's some level of what 
contextualization so when we come to the methods remember we went through them in 2 2 bto and bot that is build transfer operate build operate and transfer right build transfer operate and build operate and transfer we said in either case it's a new project in either case the private investor is bringing in money in either case rix is going to be allocated in either case the private investor is allowed to operate the project for a number of years to recoup initial investments in either case in either case no problem but the distinction here is that under build transfer and operate the transfer in ownership occurs immediately the asset is ready then the contracting entity or the government gives right to the private investor to operate the asset for an agreed number of years to recoup their investment but under both build operate and transfer after building the private investor operates the asset for a number of years to recover their investment at the end of the agreed, agreed term, the residual asset is then transferred to the contracting entity. So that is the distinction between BTO and BOAT. Then we came to MO and SE, maintain and operate and service concession. We said in either case, there is an existing operations, just that the operation is not effective or operating to its optimum then a private investor or a private entity is then brought in to provide that public service that is more and se but what is the distinction in maintain and operate is an agency relationship what does that mean it means that the, we bring in a private entity for less than five years to provide a service and we pay the private entity and that is all so the private entity does not invest any money into the project the private entity doesn't bear any risk all the risks associated with the operations of the entity will be borne by the contracting entity or the government but in service concession the private entity is brought to come and operate and provide the public goods but in addition to that they will bring some investments hence risks is going to be allocated or shared between the private entity and the contracting entity for that reason the private entity is given a longer period of time so that they can recoup their investment and that is service concession and the examiner has brought questions over and over again for the service concession because in accordance with ipsos 32 there are some rec uh, recognitions and conditions that must be met for the contracting entity to recognize the assets and liabilities in respect of service concession so these are also the two things here then we come to boo i mean not boo what you know but boo i mean so build own and operate here one district one factory let that be in your mind so under build own and operate there's no transfer government doesn't get anything what does government get government just get a bragging rights that oh we've created job oh the city has reduced oh there is economic growth oh our gdp is increasing that's all because under boo what happens is that government provides the private sector with assistance it could be financial assistance it could be technical assistance or it could be some other type of assistance so that the private sector entity then build a business own the business and operate the business and that is all that is boo and a typical example of that is the one district one factory project that government is doing then rot that is rehabilitate operate and transfer here there is an existing asset or company but the company is no longer in operation get a difference between rot and mo and se in mo and se the operation is still in existence, just that it's not operating at its optimum capacity. It's not that efficient. So we bring in a private sector to take it off and then increase the efficiency. But in ROT, the, operation, the business is not in operation. The factory is closed down. So we bring in a private investor who revamps it and, allow, and is allowed to operate it for a number of years and then certainly they recoup their money after that the residual asset is transferred back to the contracting entity so these are the types 
of public procurement that we got to understand. So, like I said, limitations, objectives or importance, principles, types. The fifth one is the things that are outside the public procurement. It is also something that is hanging in the syllabus. I think the examiner has not really done justice to that. If you have my book, I think it's in the last page of this chapter. I don't know what the heck. It's, is it here? I think it should. Yeah, this one. Page 203. It's something that the examiner has not really asked students about. Um, so that's the issue there. Exemptions of public-private partnership arrangements. It's something you need to know about. So that's all about public-private partnership arrangements. We're done. There are five things. One of them will be in the exam hall or two of them. Limitations. Principles. Importance or objectives. Types. Exemptions. These five. Two of them may be there for 10 marks. If the examiner gets goosebumps, he does one for you for 10 marks. But that is the idea about public-private partnership arrangements. I'm done. Any follow-up questions on this one? Quickly. Any follow-up questions on this one? Or I'm good. Um, I think I'm good, right? Okay. That's nice. I don't know anything. Hey, your yeah, boy. Ninth. Oh, nah, I have to close. Why I thought that, that my time has gone like that? Oh, I have to close because I need to leave you guys to go and sleep and study. I said, eh? Say, Adama has experienced a drastic change in IGF over the past three years. A review conduct. Eh, no. Don't bring me any questions to solve for you or whatever the heck because i'm i won't do if you have a specific question about something you see clarity on fine but don't bring me don't copy a question and send to me to solve for you because i won't do that question will not be in the exam hall so don't bother yourself how do i know he won't be there so don't bother yourself okay then we go to question five, which is a no mass land area, right? No mass land area. So anything else that we've not spoken about will be in question five. Anything else that we've not spoken about will be in question five. Like the role or responsibilities of, you know, and uh, public officers, Auditor General, Public Accounts, public uh how do we call it principal spending officer principal account holder those things read them chart of accounts and give miss read them question five area public sector budgeting lately the examiner has been getting a lot of goosebumps about budgeting i don't know he he's gonna set you some questions on budgeting in that regard so read and some other issues like users uh, da, da, da. so anything else remaining in the question five and this is the structure of your exam and the context of the questions the structure of the exams and the context of the question i think my slide has frozen again oh Nishira. thank god i'm almost done <laughs> thank god i'm almost done so question five is going to be no mass land area i mean everything else in the are waiting to go there so this is my take for you quickly um as you go into the exam hall tomorrow why
all right so let's go i think my slide jump over a little bit but i think i'm almost done so we're gonna wrap up a, l a little bit there we go so just two three minutes we'll be out of here as you go into the exam or tomorrow this is my recommendation number one read through all the questions listen to me carefully read through all the questions now you know where each topic is gonna be but read through everything everything so in the 15 minute reading time you are looking at the requirements the requirements read all the quest the requirements read all the questions and make sure you understand the question very well because you can digress very easily i've discussed this with you guys over and over again especially during our performance evaluation test during our mock sessions i've spoken to you already and i have you know told you my mind already so as you go into the exam hall read the questions carefully and make sure you understand the context of the question before you start writing because some of you when you see a trigger word when you see a word no then your brain takes you somewhere but Maybe that's not where the examiner wants you to go. So be careful. I'm begging you. Public sector is very, you know, a little bit slimy, if I can say that. If you're not careful, the examiner will ask you one thing and you'll be saying another. So read all the questions carefully to understand the context of the question. Then you want to take out the easy peasy areas generally and this like i said could be the question one area the question four public private partnership and then uh public procurement and then the question five the no mass land area the ones there that you can answer make sure that you are answering each question on a fresh page that's that's the most important thing so read through all the questions start with the easy ones as much as possible the question one question four and question five the ones you can answer take them out as fast as possible then you can come to question three the pifa we don't know what will be there i told you there could be written aspect or calculation and interpretation then the evaluation of financial statement that one you'll be writing english so be prepared for that then your question one sorry question two like i said should be your last question or your last but one question If you decide to go f with question three or question two first, like I said, your chances of passing the exam will be slim. That is why I am recommending that you go this particular way for the most part in that case. So that is the idea about that. Okay. Then, so read through all the questions start with the easy ones question one question four question five then question three and question two will require time the the, the, the strategy is that you'll be able to save some time from those easy areas then you come and use them on these difficult areas which will require more time and more thinking all right now because it's a largely written paper i've told you this already make sure you are mindful of the english language okay your handwriting and all those things make sure you are mindful of it as you go into the exam hall be mindful of it whatever you are writing make sure you are writing <laughs> something that is sensible all right yeah i understand um uh, sometimes i use unfriendly words and uh, some of you are not comfortable with it but that's the reality if you write something that is not sensible it's it's wrong and uh, you don't want me to say it like that but if it is unsensible then it's wrong so be careful of the answers you are producing and that is why I said read the questions well and understand the requirements of the question so that as you are writing you are writing the answer you are expected to write if not, you will come out and say, oh, what a paper, e e e. Results will come and you'll be, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, so 
work on your English make sure you get a context of the question very well and write out very well finally it's about the analysis flow you're going to be doing the analysis like I said in question 3 whether it's common size ratio analysis or budget variance analysis you write an analysis I have given you the guidelines of the analysis please make sure you go over that before you finally throw your book away to go and sit down for the exam so that you follow the principle for analyzing the financial performance financial position of the entity please follow the blueprints so yes read through all the questions take out the easy marks question two and three should be your last and last but one question that is my recommendation but like i said if you get to the exam hall and something comes over you and you want to do something else i wish you all the best i'm going to be praying for you as you are in the exam hall and definitely you should be good at the end of the day in that particular case work on your english grammar your uh, handwriting and all that the analysis be mindful of it as well as you go into the exam hall in that particular case so these are some of the things that i would say you should pay attention to there are other things i mean i've talked to you about them in some of the other sessions your emotions very important that you are mindful of your emotions because you know a lot will be going on with you so just make sure you work on your emotions very well as you go into the exam hall don't be under pressure okay left with me alone after the session bath and sleep okay but some of you this is the time you are going to now learn go and bath freshen up and sleep so that you can relax your brain and tomorrow it's a quality breakfast let's a driver chauffeur you have a chauffeur take you to the exam hall no pressure no worries you go and get your time your decks sit down you are you are not under pressure you're just flipping okay question one what else can i revise oh question two what else can i look at question three the pifa okay what else in pifa do i have to look at well okay evaluation what do i have to pay attention to no pressure like at this time it's just cruising time because if you don't balance your emotions well some of you are going to have a lot of stress in the exam hall so that's it about that and i'm going to end here today it's almost 9 40 gotta leave you to go i'm not supposed to go that far i don't know how the heck i went that far right so that's it about that and uh we end here today we wish you all the best as you go into the exam hall for the public sector examination and um my recommendation like i said is um just do what i've asked you to do pay attention to the things that i've told you question one question two question three question four I it's easy to pass the public sector examination don't don't overburden yourself and like i said if you're somebody who is now going to sit down and come and solve past questions and all that don't wait don't don't be doing that because you're going to be buying pressure for yourself unnecessarily just go slow do what i have asked you to do you'll be good you'll be good yes i understand some of the areas there's a lot of material there like procurement yeah but you still gotta read so just find a way to read what you have to read what you can go to the exam hall and optimize yourself manage your time very well you can't answer all the five questions although it is recommended that you attempt all the five questions the reality is you can't answer all the five questions that's the reality so you have to optimize yourself generally in relation to which of the questions you can answer as fast as possible so that you can attempt many of the questions before they say stop work if you can do a lot of the questions within the three hours you will pass and for those of you who are slow people there is no hope for you because there is no room for slow people oh and i'm a slow person i'm a slow reader i'm a slow writer continue nobody cares about you so work with speed and accuracy but in speed and accuracy make sure you're not committing errors so that's it about that India today wishing you all the best and uh, 
we will see you some other time in whatever april or so something like that your results will be released by first week in april on april fool ish <laughs> so that's it about that all the best catch you in april <laughs> for your next journey as you continue bye bye <laughs>